Amen. Let's see here. Let me go this way. Just taking a few texts real quick before we get started. <laughs> Some of you religious folks just left me. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 20. I want to start there, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. It will be on the screen for some of you that just panicked <clears throat> for two reasons. One's I didn't bring my Bible, and two, I don't know where to find it. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I tell them in our starting point class, don't be so religious. Just go to the front of the book, look up where it's at, and turn to it. Come on, somebody. We'd be flipping through stuff and thinking, oh, mm, Jesus. You just, like you got your eyes closed, like you're praying. You know you don't know where you're at. <laughs> We're done, done, moved on to the next five verses, and you finally run across it. Amen. I used to do that. That's why I know this stuff. Look, Just look it up in the front of the book if you don't know it. Then try to memorize some of it. I, you know, there's some books in here, man, you try to find, and you think they done tore that out of my book. My kids, my grandkids done come through and tore that out of my book, out of my Bible. But it's in there. Amen. Um, I, I don't know um, if I could title this message. I didn't title it. I told Hunter, I said, I didn't title the message because uh, I didn't know what to title it. But if, 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 if there was a title to be had, it would be simply two words, in him, in him. In him, where we all need to be, in him. Uh, in uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, I'm going to read about three verses, and then I want to go ahead and forewarn you in the last verse, in 31, I'm just going to read two words. I'm not taken away from God's word. That's just where I need to stop. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, I'll take that that he's talking to me. I'm an overseer. I'm your shepherd. I'm, I'm leading the flock. And so it's really telling me to guard you. And so that's what I try to do with his word. Verse 29 says, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, that's important. Now, Paul's writing to the church, uh, or well, probably Luke here, but it's, it's really speaking of a couple of things here. But he's saying, after I depart, the Holy Spirit, after departs, the, after he departs, the Holy Spirit, there's going to be wolves that's going to come into the flock. There'll be people coming in, and they won't spare the flock. They're not going to spare. You're not, because you belong to LVA Church, you're, you, don't, you don't have some kind of immunity. Because you belong to any church, you don't have an immunity. The enemy is out to get you. There'll be wolves that come in and try to deceive you. Verse 30 says, Also, of your own selves shall men arise... Speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Oh, preacher, not in this church or not in this day and age. Certainly. It happened. You read it all through Acts. You, you, you read where uh, uh, Paul even addresses some uh, of people that he helped rear up. And he says they were of us, but now they're not. And so uh, there are false teachers and false prophets everywhere. They're referred to as the Antichrist. In verse 31 it says, the first two words I want to say is, therefore, watch. You have to be on guard. So pastor, why are you telling us this? Because you need to watch. You need to be in your word. You, because what happens is if you're not in your word, people will get come, with some, come at you with some things that sound really close to the truth but are not the truth. And if it's not the truth, then you get led away thinking that that was the truth because you didn't really know the truth. You know, a partial truth is a lie. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles while we're... Uh, Flip with me over to Ephesians chapter 1. 
Now, I want to tell you how you can stay right with God. You ready? Y'all, 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 y'all got to loosen up. Give me a little. Y'all are tight this morning. I can tell by looking at your faces. You are tight. But I'm going to tell you how to stay right with God. I'm going to tell you how you can, uh, you can get right with God in an instant. And you can think you're right with God, and all of a sudden something will happen, and you, you, wasn't, you thought you was, but you wanted to make sure you were right with God. So uh, this past week, <clears throat> Ethan and Shelby went to Nashville. And we were keeping their little dog. I'm really not an inside dog kind of person, okay? That's just not me. If you are, amen. I don't have a problem with that. Little dog. Little wiry dog. What kind of dog is this? Schnauzer mix. Wired up. Do you hear me? I'm telling you, so wired up before we went to bed, we opened two cans of Red Bull, put it in his bowl so he could drink it to calm down. I'm talking about this dog's wired up. Do you hear me? If you're not used to a dog in your house, you're just not used to a dog in your house. I go to bed really early a lot of times, sometimes this time of year, and, and so Tina's been sleeping in the other room, and she kind of uh, got attached to this little dog. Made it a pallet. How many of you know what a pallet is? I used to sleep on a pallet. Made a little pallet right by the bed, her bed in the other room. I'm sleeping in our room. I mean, you know, God didn't call me to sleep in another room. Y'all heard me say that, right? No argument too bad, too long, too deep, too heated that I'm going to have to sleep in another room. Come on. But anyway, we weren't in an argument. She was just in, in you know, I was just in bed early. She didn't want to wake me. She had this pallet for this dog. And so during the night, I have to do what men my age do at 55. We got to get up and go to the bathroom. So at 4 a.m. in the morning, I'm standing there doing my thing in the dark. I like it to be dark when I go to sleep. And I'm standing there doing my thing. And this little dog licked me on the back of my leg. I got saved all over again. Do you hear me? I told my wife the next morning... Need to clean up in the master bathroom. Because it wasn't good. Do you hear me? I'm telling you. But I got right with God. I, was, I told you I was going to tell you how to get right with God. Get you a little dog. Borrow you a little dog from somebody. And keep it one night. And if you ain't right with God, get him to go to the bathroom. Turn that dog loose. My wife probably was behind it. It sounds funny, but you know, a lot of thoughts run through my mind at 4 a.m. with something wet on the back of your leg, and you hear, <laughs> I'm just saying, God has a way of getting your attention no matter what time of the day it is. So you thought I was going to give you some spiritual thing about how to get right and stay right. You just get a dog that you don't, just let him come in the house and you ain't used to him. Amen. I tell you that story to kind of get you loosened up this morning because you're going to need it. Uh, you know you're going to need it because I usually preach from here because it's easy, but I've got so many notes in my Bible that I, I, uh, I, I said, well, well, I don't have to copy them. I just read them. So Ephesians chapter 1, I am reading from the King James Version. Uh, if you don't read from the King James Version, or you do, it doesn't make you any more holy or any more righteous. It's just a version, and that's what this Bible was given to me. It was a King James. I requested a new King James, and the person that gave me the Bible thought I needed uh, a King James instead of a new King James. And so I've just been studying out of it since 2012. Amen. And so in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is the uh, speaking here. He's the author of this book. <clears throat> and I'm going to, I want to teach you this morning. I want, to, I want to teach you so that you can be on guard, okay? Uh, I may not do as much preaching as teaching, but this is what the Lord has laid on my heart. Paul, <clears throat> verse, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, 
by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to understand that he's just not talking to the people at Ephesus. He gives two groups of people in the opening verse, and it says, to those that are at Ephesus and to those who are faithful in Christ. So there's two groups of people. You are, if you're saved, you're in this group. If you're at Ephesus right now, you're in this group. How many is at Ephesus? How many is at this church? How many are you in Christ? Okay, so this is going to apply to you. All right? <clears throat> so it says, um, and I'm going to, like, again, I'm going to teach. I'm going to teach you some things this morning. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. You must understand some terminology before I get to the meat of the message. By the will of God. That will simply means, the, the, the Greek word is thaleo. Not phileo, not like love, but phileo, T-H-E-L-O, with one of them marks on the top of it, okay? How many ever writes like that? I mean, let me, let me put a mark up there. Phileo means Desire. By the desire, so you can read this, and this is what it would sound like. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the desire of God. Man, wouldn't that be awesome? That God desired you? Well, you're fixing to learn that he does. Oh, he does desire you. He says um, that by the desire of God to the saints that are Ephesus and the faithful ones in Christ. Verse 2. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 3. Blessed be the God of Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So there's blessings that we know that originate from heaven. Matter of fact, all spiritual blessings originate in heaven. But I'm not in heaven right now. Are you? No, no, you're here. Look, I'm not going to give you any trick questions. You're looking at me like, do I answer this? Is this just... But I'm here. And there's spiritual blessings that happen here. Not, not financial blessings, spiritual blessings. How many of you have been blessed spiritually? When you, you grow, that's a spiritual blessing. You get revelation of God's word, that's a spiritual blessing. When you open up God's word and you've read that passage, a passage, 10, 15, 20, maybe 30 times, and it comes to life, that is a spiritual blessing. That's a revelation that comes from God. So from heaven, that's where God resides, by the way, if you were wondering. <clears throat> and that blessing comes and it opens your eyes for you to grow spiritually. The Bible says uh, in, in, in uh, I believe it's in John, he says, of the, not the gospel of John, John 1, 2, 3, that he says that he would, that your soul prospers, that your soul would prosper. He wants you to prosper, spiritually speaking. He wants you to do that, okay? And so <clears throat> verse uh, 4 says, according as he hath chosen us in him. Who chose who? Okay, he chose you. There's many scriptures in the Bible where it says he chose you. But you also have to choose him. We're going to learn some things. He's already chose you. He chose Marty, according to Psalms 139, before my substance ever was. He says, before your substance, I, I knew you. He knew me. Not, uh, I know who, you, uh, who you're going to be. No, I know you intimately. When you see the word new, a lot of times K-E-N-E-W, in, in, the, in, the, in the Bible, it means intimacy. Like uh, Abraham knew Sarah. Not that he knew who she was, but he knew her intimately. And Christ is saying the same thing here that in Psalms 139, that he knew me. He knew you intimately. He knew everything about you. It says, according to, as he has chosen us in him, where? Before the foundation of the world. That we should be what? Holy. holy without what? Before him in love. Now, he chose us to be in him, be holy and without blame before you ever existed. How is that possible? How is that possible? How can, how can he choose you when you're not here? Well, it's kind of a two-sided a two coin, if you will. 
He knew you then because he's God. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He, he cannot not know all things. I know that's bad grammar. He's just God. He knows everything at the same time, and nothing escapes his, his thoughts, his mentality, his knowing. His, he, he, you cannot escape it. And so he says, I knew you then. Before you were nothing, I knew you. And the scripture says, before the foundation of the world, and that we are to be holy and without blame. He set us up before we were anything to be holy and without blame. He chose us to be holy and blameless. Well, man, that's like getting a head start at a race. Did you hear what? I, that's like getting a head start at a race. That's like going down when some of you go down to play the lottery. You shouldn't. But if you do win, we do accept lottery tithe. The Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Where was I going with that? So it's like getting a head start. It's like going to play the lottery. And if there's, I don't know how to play the lottery. Do you do it by numbers? Don't be shy on me, people. You buy tickets. And it's got numbers, six, seven, eight numbers, five. Six. Got six numbers. Scotty, let's talk. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm picking on Scotty. So you got six numbers. It's like, you know, you getting five of the numbers. And he says, now I'm not going to tell you the last number, but it's one. But I'm not telling you the last number. That's like, that's what's happening right here. He's setting you up and giving you all this stuff. If you'll read this and get it, he set me up before, before I was born to be holy and without blame. In Christ. You can't do it apart from him. It says in Christ. Okay? Before him in love. That's what it says. Okay, verse 5. Now, having predestined us unto the adoption of children... By Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. A good pleasure of his will. That desire. Did I remember I told you that while ago? Thaleo. That desire. According to his good will, his pleasure, it pleases him to predestine you to be holy and without blame. That pleases God. That's what it says. He predestined you. When? Way back then. And he chose us. This is where we get mixed up sometimes on predestination and pre-election. Okay? I'm not preaching on that today. I'm simply showing you some word of God so that you understand what this word says. That you are set up. He set you up to be holy and to be blameless way before you ever thought of. That's really what I'm on. In him, that's the message. Not predestination. We're not talking about that really. I'll prove to you that I don't believe that in this message. I think it's a bunch of hocus pocus. Okay? That's me. Okay? I'm just telling you about God's word. It says, having predestined us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Jesus, we know that there's the triune Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, okay? He predestined us, but it says here in Christ Jesus, before the foundation of the world, Christ was in the triune Godhead, but he had not been to the cross yet. Come on, I'm going somewhere with this. And the Bible says that he's predestined us unto the adoption of children to be adopted in by Jesus Christ. You got to go through Jesus Christ to get adopted in. You got to go through the waterfall of the blood of Jesus Christ to be forgiven of your sins. It's in Jesus Christ that this predestination idea and theory comes to fruition that when I step into Christ and I give him my heart, I give him my life, I love him with my heart, soul, and mind, it's then that the predestination, God's desire for my life before I was even known comes to fruition when I say yes to the Lord. I'm predestined because it's his will. He chose me. He loved me. He chose you. 
Did he pick you out and pick you out and not pick you? No. He chose all of us, all of us, to be in Christ, but not all people are in Christ. It's God's will that everybody be saved, but not everybody's saved. You got some desires for your own children or grandchildren, don't you? Well, you should have. Let's try it again. You have some desires for your children and grandchildren, don't you? Amen. Amen. But if you live long enough and maybe they're older now and you're seeing, boy, that didn't turn out like I really wanted. Right? Same principle here. You got a choice. Now watch this. Am I doing okay so far? Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. He made us accepted. Who made us? Christ Jesus. Through the blood, he made us accepted by his grace. It was by grace, through faith, that you're saved. It says, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. In him, in Christ, the triune Godhead, you're accepted if you go through the cross, if you go through Jesus Christ. Any other way, the Bible says that if you try to enter the the gate any other way, you're a thief. Thieves don't enter the kingdom of heaven, by the way. Verse 7. In whom, in whom... We have redemption, what? Through his, not through his predestination that you're picked. Through his blood, watch. In whom we have redemption through his blood. If we're predestined, if we are predestined, again, I'm not speaking on that. That just happens to be the verses that we're on at this moment. If you're predestined, why do you have to be redeemed? See, if you're predestined, if you you fall into that category and you're predestined, then there's no need for you to be redeemed. You're just predestined. But the Bible says that you're predestined in him before you you were known, but you got to go through Christ. And it says very clearly that you, in him we have redemption through his blood, not through the pre-picking. The forgiveness of sins. Oh, there's that word. You got to get forgiveness of your sins. The predestination is there. He loves you. He chose you. Before you were known. Before your substance was. The psalmist says, before my substance was, you knew me. How is that possible? I don't know. But God's God, and I'll let him be God. You can talk about it when you get to heaven. You'll have plenty of time. Until then, quit trying to be so theologically correct and that you know God and you know all about God. Let me just tell you, if somebody tells you they got all the answers to this Bible, you say you're an antichrist and you're a false prophet and you run from them. Because if they knew that, they would be God. And if they knew that, God wouldn't be God because he, he, he would be known You could know what he knows. Well, that's not possible. Amen. Glory to God. I'm going to do it okay. All right. Verse, in him who we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. I don't know what riches look like in heaven. I don't. But this gives us an indication. He uses gold for asphalt in heaven. So the Bible says that the streets are of pure gold. If that's some kind of scale, I don't, there's no value in asphalt, really. I mean, get you a clump of it and take it down here to the jeweler and say, I got me a big old pretty piece of asphalt. What will you give me? <laughs> Nothing. But God said gold is on the streets in heaven. There's got to be something to the riches of heaven. 
that we don't understand. But all of the splendor and the glory and the riches of the kingdom of heaven says that, in, in this word it says, according to the riches, you have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according, in other words, in great immeasurable abundance toward you and I. I mean, that's how much of anybody, anywhere, anytime can come to the Lord for forgiveness of sins. You must be forgiven of sins to enter the kingdom of heaven, period. There's no other way. You hear, you, the book came out several years, uh, All Roads Lead to Heaven. Well, you've heard me say that's not absolutely 100% incorrect. Oh, every road's going to get you by there because you've got to stand before the Lord. <laughs> but there may not be an exit for you there. Verse 8, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and all prudence, having made known to us, verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Well, what is the mystery in context of Ephesians 1? What is the mystery of his will? He tells us that you're predestined. If you read enough Bible, I said in Psalms 139, you know when you were chosen by God. He says that he chose us. There is no mystery here. The mystery is unrevealed when he says, I predestined you to be accepted according to all the riches in heaven through Christ Jesus by his blood for the forgiveness of sins. It just unfolded. There is, there is no escaping that you must come to Christ in order to be forgiven of your sins. It's, it's an impossibility to do it any other way. The mystery is no longer a mystery if you take time to read this part of the book. Here's that according to his, in verse 9, according to his good pleasure. That phrase also is the same word, thaleo, and it means desire, according to his desire. His good desire. I don't know about you. I don't know what heaven's going to be like, but it's going to be good. <laughs> if this world is good, and it is because God made it. Now, it may not be good to you right now because of circumstances or, I'm going to go on and say it, just dumb choices. Everything that happens in your life, God didn't, God didn't make happen. Sometimes just your, Jesus' name. Just you. I, I've been there. That's why I can say that. I get in the middle of that, get in the middle of my stuff. I say, God, don't you love me, God? Where you at, God? He's, oh, I've been loving you the whole time. You're just acting stupid again. You've made this choice. You want me to get you out of it again? Yeah, I do, God. I won't do it again. I promise I won't do it again. And then you do it again. Yeah. Having made known unto us, in verse 9, I'm still there. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. The mystery of his will is that God wants you saved, period. He wanted you saved so much that he sent his only begotten son to die on a cross, a gruesome death that you and I could be saved. I don't mean have good church attendance. I'm talking about saved all the way through, saved down in that part that you know that you know that you know that you saved. That no matter what happens, your hope is in Christ Jesus. Your hope is not in the materialistic things. If it's all gone tomorrow, you still have hope that if I die, the worst thing that can happen to you here is on earth is actually the best thing if you know Christ if you die. We say that's the worst thing that could happen. No, that's the best thing if you're a believer that could ever happen to you is that you die because, bam, instantly you, you're in the throne of heaven. You're in that heavenly realm. Well, I think that's a pretty good place. I mean, if it's not, why are we living the way we're living now? 
it's got to get better than this. And if this is it, I'm like, oh, golly. And I've got a great life. My wife still loves me. My grandkids right now, because they're young, they adore me. They think I can do anything and everything. They like me more than they like their parents. You know why? Because I'll let them do anything they want to. No. I always forget he's standing back there. He's going to delete that right there so his kids will never hear that. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. When he returns, he said, at that fullness of time, I'm going to gather everything in heaven and in earth together in him. There's this in him. you got to be in him. Because if you're not in him, when he comes, when that fullness of time comes, you won't be in him. You, you're in him now. And if you don't make the choice now, guess what? There's no opportunity to make the choice later. You're going to know that you should have made the choice in hell. I believe, I personally believe this about hell, that one of the greatest torments is you're going to hear sermons about getting right with Jesus. And you're going to, you're going to relive those things. I, I believe that. That would be the greatest torment. You ever beat yourself up or over something that you know you should have done but you didn't do it and, you, and then later on you find out that would have been a great thing for you but somebody else got it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of the same principle. Verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. What is the counsel? That's what he wants done out of the counsel of his own will, out of the desires of his will. What he predetermined to happen, that's the counsel of his will. So let's back up. He predestined us to be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, the shedding of blood, right? That's his counsel. That's his will. If it wasn't his will, why did he send Jesus Christ to die on the cross? He's smarter than that. God's smarter than that. Come on now. Why would he give up his son if there's no need for the blood to be used in forgiveness of sins? That sounds crazy to me. I mean, that's just ludicrous, right? Sure. Okay. Verse 12. That we would be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In him you also trusted after that you heard, watch this now, you trusted, that's an action on your part. Here's where you start choosing God in this passage of Scripture. You trusted, come on, watch it, what does it say? You trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. There's this connection in verse 13 to the other text of the Bible that says you trust when you hear the word of God. You cannot hear, you and I did not hear anything before we were a substance. He says that I knew you in your mother's womb. Before you were a substance, I predestined you to be. Well, how can you hear the word there? You can't. How can you trust there? You don't know what to trust. You and I don't exist. Only to God do we exist. So consciously, how can we make the decision to trust God? Well, you can't. Till you get older, you, you come to this accountability age and that is not in the Bible, by the way. There's, it's not 13 or 12. It's, it's all different. There is an age of an accountability, so to speak. But it's when you learn to trust and believe, okay? So if you're looking, Pastor, they were 12 years old. Did they go to heaven? You know, they were under the cage, age of accountability. I didn't say that. Some people are a little smarter than others. I'm still playing that card right now with God. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> oh, I didn't know, Lord, no. So how can you hear 
if you're nothing, if you don't have ears yet? Well, you can't. So you got to be born physically to hear the truth, and you got to trust in that truth that what this Bible says is true. It takes faith to believe this Bible is true. Read it. You'll think, well, that is the most bizarre thing I've ever heard in my life. But when you get right with Christ and you're in him and you trust in him, uh-oh, now it takes a whole, different, a whole different turn. And when you hear the word after you've trusted the gospel of your what? Salvation. You have to be saved. You don't have to be predetermined or pre-elected You're already that, but you got to get saved in order to go to heaven. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Praise the Lord. I like that. We're going to be talking about uh, Thursday. We'll have a house full Thursday because we're going to be talking about once saved, always saved, and just being saved and all that. And I know that's a topic, boy, that's just hairy and nasty and stinks. But I'm going to tell you something. You can walk right up beside both of them and put a very thin line between both of them. You come Thursday, and I'll tell you what I think. Y'all get some extra tables Thursday. Verse 14. In which, and I'm going to let you go in just a minute. Which, uh, so, so we read verse 13. Let me read it because it kind of falls together in 14. In whom we, you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. This gospel is, is if you believe it, you trust that's your salvation. In whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You got saved, blood-bought, born again. The Holy Spirit puts a seal on you. Woo! My mama used to seal canned goods. My mama used to can everything. Man, don't, you don't leave. Look, my mama canned toys if it was in the way. She'd get busy, boy. You'd be looking for Stretch Armstrong. He'd be canned in there right next to that pickle. How many of you mama canned at the house when you were growing up? I mean, can't, Lord, big old pots. and have, You got to listen to it pop. When that thing popped, it's good. Don't touch it, though. That thing's hot. You get sealed. You'd be sealed. Holy Spirit says, I put a seal on you. Oh, I like that. Sometimes I need to be sealed. Verse 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Boy, there's a lot of stuff right there. There's a whole message right there. So let's back up and unpack it a minute, okay? Which is the earnest. You're thinking, what does that mean? What does that mean? The earnest of our inheritance. That word earnest, if you look at it, means the deposit. You ever bought anything and they said, well, you're going to need to have some earnest money. You know what earnest money does? Earnest money doesn't uh, buy that thing that you put it down. But it ensures, come on somebody, that if you give earnest money to some, somebody for something that they can't sell it off Monday. And you have the dates on that. From here to here, you got so long that for you to come up with the rest of the money. I like earnest money because it takes me a while sometimes. Come up with the rest of it. Amen. Some of you are like, oh, I don't even know what he's talking about. God put a deposit, the Holy Spirit sealed by the Holy Spirit, means he deposited, he put earnest money down on you. He's believing, I know God don't bet, so don't, don't get all weird on me, but the Holy Spirit's betting you're going to make it. He says, enough so that I'm going to put a deposit down, some earnest money, because I really want him in the kingdom or her in the kingdom of heaven. So I'm going to put some earnest money down on some. You don't put earnest money down on something you don't want. If you do, we need to talk. You put your earnest money back here in this little box that's tithe and offering. Because you 
Something wrong with that picture. But God says the Holy Spirit put a deposit of our inheritance. I'm predetermined to have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Listen to me clearly. Every prostitute, every drunkard, every addict, every pedophile, every lesbian, every gay person has an inheritance that Christ has put down on them to go to heaven. Their inheritance is to be with him, believe it or not. Because he loves you no more than he loves them. Because he chose all of us to be in him. But some of us just aren't there yet. But he believes so strongly in us that he put earnest money down that they would come to him. And that earnest money was his son, Jesus Christ, who died upon the cross and shed his precious blood that is invaluable, that money cannot purchase. He shed his blood for earnest money that you have a way to come to him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I trust this gospel to be true. That's your part. I trust it, and I heard it, and I believe it, so I come to Christ. This is just good stuff. This is too simple. You know why I know it's simple? Because I'm getting it. (laughs) So we have this earnest money put down on us for an inheritance until the redemption, watch this, the redemption of the purchased possession. Well, how did he purchase you? Through the blood. You've been bought with a what? A price. Some of you don't even know that. Let's try to. You've been bought with a. Price. You've been bought with a. Price. Say, I've been bought with a price. price. That price, say it with me, that price, price. is the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. See, that's redemption. That's the plan. If you want to be predestined, just come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Accept him. Trust the word of God. And he's already put a down payment on you. You're already his. You just don't know it. And then when you come to this idea that through trusting this Bible, trusting the gospel, and hearing the word of God, you say, oh, my eyes are open. This revelation, this mystery that used to be a mystery is no longer a mystery. I can be in Christ Jesus just like anyone else. Oh, this is too cool. Just glory to God. This word redemption in verse 14. Oh, I could throw out this Greek word right here. And you'd think, Lord, help. What is he saying? So I'm not going to, I'll spell it for you. I don't even know how to say it. It's something like apolotrosis, A-P-O-L-O-O-T-R-O-S-I-S. And you got some hyphens and some lines like this and all that on top of them words. I didn't tell you. I told you that I, I, I don't know Greek, right? Well, I still don't know Greek. You know some Greek or Hebrew, both. Okay. Thank God we're talking about Greek stuff right now. He'd be thinking, man, he's a nut. Y'all think it's easy to preach up here, don't you? Well, he knows Hebrew. Who wants to preach next week? Okay. Which the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Redemption means this. The releasing affected by payment of something. It's a releasing affected by payment. This earnest money gives you the right to, re- to release, gives the right for you to come to Christ, in other words. There's a releasing. In other words, you have the right now by this down payment, there's a release that's went on that you can come to Christ. That's what redemption means. Watch this. <clears throat> it also means liberation procured by the payment of ransom. Anybody ever remember hearing something in the Bible that he was made a ransom for you? The procurement means to purchase. Some of you may work in procurement. You may be uh, in that field in your your building, in your work. 
Procurement means to purchase. This word redemption means that he has procured. He has put earnest money down. He has purchased you with the blood of Jesus Christ, but you must accept. It also means this. I like this one because it's only three words. Redemption means this. The price, not the price because that would be for. Price for redeeming. Price for redeeming. Jesus Christ paid the price so that you can be redeemed. You got to be redeemed. You're not just picked, and that's all. Yes, true. That's partly true. You are picked, but you got to be redeemed. And until you get redeemed, you're just you're just unsaved. You got to get saved. You got to be redeemed. You got to be purchased with the blood. the The price has already been paid. You just have to receive it. You have to receive a gift. Cookie, if I was to, can I call you Cookie or do I need to call you Mary here in public? Good, because I think Cookie's better. That's what I know you by. Some of you are saying, Cookie, we have a different relationship, okay? So, Cookie, if I brought you uh, a gift of whatever your heart would desire, don't make it very big because I don't want to have much money. Pizza would be fine. Glory to God. Problem is, it's only going to be half a pizza when I get to your house. So, if I called Miss, Miss Cookie, Miss Mary, and said, hey, um, I want to bring you something. What, what is your heart's desire? She said, I'd love to have a, what kind of pizza? We've got to get this story straight. What kind of pizza? A spinach chicken. Some chicken and spinach. Woo! I like spinach and I like chicken and... I like pizza, so it's got to go good together. And I call Miss Mary up and I say, what, do you, what, what can I give you? What gift? And she says, I want a chicken and spinach pizza. Thick crust? Thin? Amen. Thin crust. From where? It doesn't matter. She's not picky. And I show up at her house with this request. This, and I say, here's the gift that you requested. I did. And I put it on the bar on the table and she says man that is that is oh that's a good looking box that smells so good oh and leans over opens it up and says oh wow that's the prettiest spinach and chicken pizza I've ever seen in my life and now I'm over here you know (laughs) like a dog (laughs) saliva running down my jaw and she's in this so beautiful and she closes the lid and says, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm thinking, we going to eat it? She says, I'm just going to leave it here. That's why I ate half of it before I got there, see? <laughs> now, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? That sounds like, well, that's kind of dumb. Why would you request something that you're not going to eat, that you're just going to leave there? And four or five days goes by, and you think, well, I'd really like to have that. Oh, that's kind of moldy. Cheese is run on it. Why, 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 that sounds crazy, wouldn't it? You know, God has requested that you be his through the blood of Jesus Christ. He sent his son and gave you the most perfect gift for you to accept him. And he died on a cross. Shed his blood for you and I. And the pizza story is not so far-fetched. Because so many people know Jesus died for them. He's a gift from God. Yet they put him to the side. And they say, man, he's a wonderful God. He looks good. Lord, oh, yeah, this is great. This is really good. Let's go to church. Yes, amen. Oh, hallelujah. But you don't know him. You've never said, let me open. Let me be in him. Let me partake of him. Let me be in Christ Jesus. You've just walked through the motions. 
It's not a crazy story after all. So if you will, will you stand all across this building?